so I lived in Africa for a little while and um, you know, there's a huge section of it that just doesn't have enough water. They've, they've got desert conditions, but there is no place on earth that gets more terawatts of energy from the sun. And the fact that they are not um, food independent in the way that uh, I think they could be has always baffled me. And, and like on, on uh, like, I would never want to be the person that cuts off food aid so people starve. But the question becomes, are there the, are the downsides of food aid uh, always worth it? You know, when one of the big things that I studied in graduate school was what happens when uh, we start delivering aid and then the people with guns end up getting it, right? And then they get to distribute it and then you're it's essentially handing them money. Do you see very much of that going on right now that that the food that we're delivering doesn't actually go through the systems that we set up and instead has to be distributed through warlords? The simple answer is yes. And it's much worse than most realize. Uh, if you could take Yemen as an example, I'm going to, I'm just going to throw a number out there, but it could be of the, you know, 130 to $140 million a month, 130 to $140 million a month that goes into Yemen for food security. Nearly 30% of that could be saw, siphoned off to the side and used to buy guns and armament to fight the battle between them and the Saudis. So, you know, it goes on, but it goes on Somali, it goes on everywhere, but we've done everything we can at the World Food Program. We've got facial recognition to make sure we're giving food resources to the right person. Uh, they're about ready to go to ear recognition because I guess it's better than the facial recognition, but they're doing everything they can to make sure they're giving food to the right people and aren't giving twice the amount or the wrong amount. So, but anyway, in Yemen, for as an example, we may load up a truck in Sana and head it out through the country to go to some remote village somewhere to make a delivery. But some of those trucks are stopped 45 times to get to that last mile. And every time they're stopped, you don't know if it's somebody that's going to shoot you or what. So they give them a little more food and they may not be an intended recipient. So there goes our aid. So it's it's really difficult. And I think you've probably seen what's been going on in Yemen over the past uh, three weeks here in terms. No, of, no, I have n absolutely no idea what's happening in Yemen. Whether there's some there's some discussions that's been going on about uh, uh, whether the Houthis would be designated as, as a terrorist organization. So uh, that's that's taking a little bit of a different perspective of how we look at food aid there right now. Uh, again, we continue to try to deliver as much as we can to make sure we're doing the right humanitarian thing uh, to support the people of Yemen because uh, the Yemenis have suffered a lot. Uh, but, you know, like I said, this goes on in Somalia, it goes on Sudan, South Sudan, everywhere. Uh, but the World Food Program has really worked diligently to create systems to reduce uh, uh, the aid getting siphoned off into some of these other obscure channels that are used for other things besides solving hunger. It's a pretty awesome responsibility to be uh, to be in the role that you're in where people's lives hang in the balance as long as you and your teams can keep up the systems and the deliveries and the relationships. Did you have trouble sleeping at night? I think everybody has trouble sleeping at night that's in, that is involved with this. It, it's, it's not about thinking about the child you fed today. It's about the child you didn't feed today. And that's what keeps you up at nights. It's what creates the emotion that, that upsets a lot of us over time because there's many that we're not getting to. You know, we're feeding 130 million people around the world right now in 85 countries, the World Food Program is. Um, but we see that number almost doubling over the next year because of COVID, because of the impacts of COVID. So that's of extreme concern. When we know that we have budget shortfalls, we need more money to not only make the humanitarian uh, assistance work and, and feed people, but at the same time, while we're there, let's create resilience capacity, but it takes the political will of prime ministers, presidents, uh, those in government in these countries to allow technology, innovation, other farming systems to come in. Um, nearly 70 to 80% of the places where we're delivering food aid around the world are in the midst of a man-made conflict. It used to be the end of the World Food Program went out and they delivered food aid when they had a tsunami, earthquake, uh, volcano, uh, eruption, whatever. Those kinds of natural disasters today, it's all man-made conflict. So if we could have an, an impact on that man-made conflict, which we don't know, it could have been caused because of hunger to start with. 
So it's kind of a vicious circle, but what we need to do, and I keep repeating this, is create resilience capacity, but it takes the political will of the nation's leaders to allow these technologies to come in. Well, the political will is an interesting uh, concept. One of the best books I read after graduate school was a book called The Dictator's Handbook, The Rules for Rulers. And it just did a very good job of outlining when you get to the heights of power in a small republic where where force is a big component of it, change is your enemy. Because change means that some some part of that system might not be in the same way. You may not be able to extract value out of it and then be able to use that value to distribute to your friends and to your political partners. And uh, that's it's one of those things where... I went into the World Bank imagining that the world was much more um, simple, that there were good guys and there were bad guys. But as you play the game longer, you start finding out, well, if I was in his position, I think I might both view myself as the good guy and be willing to do many of the things that he's doing. And I think that that's one of the complexities about being in your world is that you have to... uh, If you hold everybody to account by the standards of an Indiana farmer... Uh, they'll never they'll never match up, right? Because their worldview is just so different. Yeah, I, I would say this. It, it's we have to find a place where we can make an example of a country that gets this right, and this is why we feel particularly uh, excited about Sudan. Following the Abraham Accords, the agreement between um, Sudan, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Israel, and the United States, to where. Religious freedoms are are now uh, allowed. Uh, everybody can coexist. We have a leader, uh, Prime Minister Hamdouk, that is very interested. He sees agriculture as the main pillar of rebuilding their nation, the first one that needs to be stood up. And so he's really excited about allowing innovation to come in, making sure that we can get the International Development Finance Corporation in. We can bring in the World Bank, and we can really have an impact on changing lives. And I think once we... Once we prove this concept and bring it forward, where they're using GMO as an example, where they have fall armyworm in, in Sudan, all of a sudden, all some of these member states or these other countries around them, all of a sudden understand that, hey, look, it's working over there, but the, how did it happen? It's because the political leader of the country had the will and the commitment to stand behind it and push the corrupt behaviors and activities that's taking place in the past off to the side and understanding doing what's best for their people. And that's what we need to continue to do. From your firsthand view, a place like uh, Africa, there is a lot of uh, Chinese um, movement into the diplomacy world. Is China in the food game? Are they also providing humanitarian aid? China is a very small contributor to the World Food Program, very small. I think they're even under France. France commits, I think, 19 million a year. Uh, As I said, the U.S. is 3.7 billion a year. China's even less than France, I think. Uh, They've had very little commitment. Now, that's not to say they haven't put a lot of money into Africa. We know, for instance, China's been very effective in in, uh, with contracting of natural resources throughout the continent. Train lines and uh, office parks with the World Bank and doing loans to to build infrastructure that maybe hasn't been as successful as it should have been. So there's been a lot of uh, interest by China. Uh, there's no doubt they're probably the biggest player in, in investing in other things in, in Africa, maybe not food security, but in other things, but not necessarily to the benefit of the African nations. And uh, I think this is where we have a difference. The United States goes in with uh, capacity. And, and, and contributions and, and, and compassion, whereas China goes in and brings money in, but there's always a hook. There's always something we want back for ourselves. And I think this is where, you know, they need to change their behaviors. At the same time, I think we need to look at aid a little bit differently. Not as though we should pull aid away, but I think we should look at it saying, listen, we've been feeding people in your, in your nation for four generations. Now, I can't imagine, first of all, being a young person growing up in a family that's been under four generations of living only on humanitarian aid, no jobs, no economic benefits, no real good health care, no schooling, no education. That's not sustainable. 
So this is where I think we we need to look at of going in like we're you know, planning to do in Sudan and create the economic opportunities to bring in jobs to to improve food security to improve lifestyles and, and education and healthcare. So that's why I'm so excited about the opportunities in Sudan. But we need to shine the spotlight on them as we show that success. But that's why I think we need to look at aid saying, listen, you've got the capacity to do it. Here's your timeline. Start to make sure this works soon. We really do. We yeah, I mean, it. man, it's, I I would uh, applaud anybody that would do that because I'm totally in agreement. So I, when I worked at the World Bank, my experience was um, mixed. There were things that I saw there that I thought if some if they weren't doing it, nobody would, and things would fall through the cracks. But that you also see that many of the times when they uh, do the handouts, they're the handouts are not ultimately bringing up capacity. So I'm completely with you, but I cannot imagine the political will that would be required to pull back on some of those programs if people didn't meet uh, their criteria. I mean, we don't even pull back money when they don't meet their loan criteria. I can't imagine we would do it if it was food. Yeah, it's 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 not gonna be an easy discussion. It's not gonna be easy to make it happen, but the reality is, um, you know, it needs, it has to happen. We cannot sustain a continent that's gonna double its population yet can't feed itself today, can't even, doesn't have any economic opportunity. And I can tell you that uh, not only will uh, different countries around the world's own security and peace be at risk, so will the United States of America. And that's why I say it's, 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 it should be behooven of us to make sure that we hold these countries committed and, and accountable to the dollars we're bringing in to make sure that their people are benefiting from it. Yeah, I mean, Norman Borlaug was the one that was kind of credited with if if people have empty stomachs, they're going to go to war. So you need to fill their stomachs in order to make them not that way. So let's turn stateside. You're returning back to the United States to uh, the place that is growing all this food. What are you observing about the U.S. agricultural system now that you've been out and about in the world that you hadn't noticed before? Yeah, you know, the U.S. system, it, it's, it's, it's always been, the U.S. agricultural production supply chains have always been evolving. I mean, a lot of people want to look at food systems, and we're, we've been having this discussion around the U.N. Food System Summit very frequently for the past uh, 10 months. But um, And some people will look at the U.S. food system and say, uh, we need to reinvent everything. Well, the reality is, no, we don't. Uh, as an example, in 1920, we had 2 billion people on the face of the earth, and nearly 80% were living in poverty. Today, we have nearly 7.8 billion people on the face of the earth, and under 10% are living food insecure. So, you know, our food system in the United States has continued to evolve. It's got to continue. It needs to continue. We need to bring in more digitization. We need to bring in more of the CRISPR technologies, GM technologies. Uh, data analytics. There's just so much that we can do to can increase productivity, protect our environment. But one of my biggest components, one of the things I see that is missing in U.S. agriculture, and this comes back to producers, is we need to be more conscious of what goes on around the world because we do not just exist within our borders. If we think that's the case, if we think we're just isolationists, we're going to be we're gonna run into trouble down the road because policy that takes place in the EU that gets uh, promoted across the continent of Africa or Southeast Asia will have an impact on trade and that trade will have an impact on the crops that we produce in the United States. So I wanna encourage farmers to take more of a global perspective of what's going on in terms of policy, advocacy and get involved. I mean, it, let's face it, in the past, farmers say, yeah, I don't need to worry about that. I'm going to let uh, the Corn Growers Association, the Soybean Growers Association, Sunflower, Canola, whatever, they're going to take care of being my voice. Well, yeah, they will. They're going to be out there in front, but you need to get involved too. You need to get involved with those organizations, but you need to educate yourself as well. This is, this is about the crops you grow, your family's legacy, the, the businesses you operate. And uh, I think it's critically important that the American farmer understand this. And I think for the most part, a lot of us get caught up in our daily business routines of taking care and it's a busy life, right? But we have our own challenges here at home, but we need to take a broader perspective. And this is what I, one of the things I would promote. <laughs> 
Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.